Hello and welcome to the second episode of the How Do You Answer uh, exam question series for the Living Under Nazi Rule OCR History B topic. Today we are looking at the 15 mark question. So in the previous video we looked at how do you answer a 7 mark question. Now we're turning our attention to the second question on the Living Under Nazi Rule paper which will be the 15 mark question. So. First step, uh, first step, sorry, as ever, with any GCSE exam question, whether it be in history or any other subject, is to work out what the question is actually asking you to sit down and properly read the question and to break it down into its component parts. So you've got in the middle of the screen there an example of a 15 mark question. It says, how useful are sources B and C and interpretation D for a historian studying the Gestapo between 1933 and 1939? In your answer, refer to the sources and the interpretation as well as your own knowledge, and it's worth 15 marks. Now, one of the common responses that students often have to the 15 mark question when they see it is, oh my gosh, that is a lot of uh, sort of writing, there's a lot of key terminology in there. How am I ever going to do that? Well, actually, when you break it down um, and when you look at what the question actually is asking you, it's really, really easy. And lots of the question actually stays the same in different years exam papers. Um, and it's just the focus that we need to try and find because that will be the specific thing for this year. So just to recap exactly what we mean when we're talking about sources and interpretations. Those of you that have watched the previous video will know already what a source is, but a source is a piece of written or visual evidence from the time period being studied. Um, as we talked about in that previous video, that could be a portrait, it could be a report, a letter, a diary extract, a speech that's been transcribed, any piece of evidence basically from that time. So you're going to have two of these uh, those sources in this question compared to just the one that you had in the seven marker. You also though have something called an interpretation to analyze here. Now an interpretation is different from a source because an interpretation is a historian's opinion looking back on an event and they will use the sources as their evidence for their specific opinion on said event. Now the main difference between the interpretations and the sources is that an interpretation is after the time period. It's looking back retrospectively, using sources from the time to form an opinion on it. Now, without realizing, lots of you watching this video in your history lessons will have made interpretations in lots of your lessons. I am confident of that because when we ask you as teachers, well, what do you think about this specific event or what do you think about that source? What's that telling you? You are then making an interpretation because you are obviously after the event and you're looking back using evidence to inform your judgments. So you're going to have two sources from the time and one historian's opinion. And then you need to use those in your answer. So what actually is the focus of the question? Well, this is the focus of this specific question. How useful are they to studying the Gestapo between 1933 and 1939? Those bits that I've highlighted in yellow will be the focus of your answer. How useful are they to studying the Gestapo between 1933 and 1939? Now, this part here where I've underlined where it says how useful, um, what we mean when, or what the exam board, sorry, mean when they're asking you how useful are they, is what can we as historians learn from the sources and the interpretation about the event. Now, because sources and interpretations are going to tell you quite useful things about the event, as a bit of a top tip, I would always, and I would encourage you to do this in your answers, always say that they are useful regardless of what your opinions necessarily are of sources B, C and interpretation D. They are always useful regardless of who has written them or said them. A common pitfall that year 11 or GCSE students will fall into is saying that a source is not useful because it is biased. So for example, if a source has been written by Joseph Goebbels, uh, the Minister of Propaganda and Enlightenment, some students will fall into the trap of saying, well, because we know that this man is in charge of propaganda, we can't trust a word he says, therefore he's lying, therefore the source is not useful. You've got to look beyond that. Yes, we know objectively that we have to be a little bit cautious about what Joseph Goebbels says. However, as a historian looking at a certain event in Nazi Germany, 
Joseph Goebbels' opinion on an event or statement about an event is really, really, really useful because it tells us the intentions of those in the Nazi leadership. It tells us what they are trying to do at that specific time and therefore it is incredibly useful. So try as hard as you can to resist the temptation of saying a source is not useful because it is biased. If you do that, you won't get out of the bottom sort of rungs of the uh, mark scheme ladder and you'll probably be looking at about three or four marks even if you've written a beautiful paragraph if you start off by saying it is not useful you are not going to get very good marks in this question because sources are always useful and the same goes for a historian's opinion another common mistake uh, students will make oh well this was written in 2015 that's you know 90 years or whatever or however long after the uh, Nazi party first sort of came about therefore we can't trust it because it's not from the time no that historian has done a lot of research and he's a professional historian they know what they are talking about that means that their work is incredibly useful because they will be able to tell you something about this specific event okay and it's your job to work out what they are telling us about this uh, focus okay so top tip always useful the bit that I've underlined in purple there then is the bits of the question that are always going to be the same. Every question as well for a 50 marker will always ask you how useful, but I've highlighted that as, as part of our focus. Um, but that will always be the same. So technically it should have a purple underline as well. But you will always get sources B, C and interpretation D. And it will always tell you to refer to the sources and the interpretation as well as your own knowledge. So that bit that's underlined in purple will always stay the same. So when students look at this question, they think, oh my God, that's a huge question. There's loads to it. Actually, when you highlight just the focus of it, that's the important bit. That's the bit that's going to change each year. And that is just basically one sentence, okay? So the bit that's in purple, you don't need to worry too much about because it is there every single year, okay? Right, you've broken down the question. You've got the question at the top of the page. You have highlighted it on your um, exam paper. Now's the time to come up with a plan. So what are you going to do? Well, if, for example, this was the question and these were the two sources and the interpretation that you were presented with in your assessment paper, you need to look out for the following things in each of them. In each of the sources and the interpretation, they will have a provenance. Now, those of you that have watched the seven mark video will know exactly what I am talking about when I talk about provenance. The provenance is that bold bit of information at the top of the source or the interpretation that tells you exactly where it has come from. It's the background, the origin of the source or the interpretation. So within the sources, the provenance is hugely important. We talked about this in the seven mark video. That's because the provenance will tell you who has written it or said it or done it or made it. That will give you lots of information because you will know or you should know from your revision who that person is. Therefore, it tells you about their intentions at that specific time. You need to think about what do I know about this person? What are they trying to do? It will also tell you what you are looking at. Again, really important for the sources because um, the what is whether it's a report, is it a portrait, is it a letter, is it a diary, is it a memorandum with statistics on it? Whatever it is will be hugely important because that will tell you the intended audience of this source. And if you can work out who it's written for or who it was designed for, then you can work out why they are making it. Okay, so if it's a speech or an article in a newspaper, that's obviously to gain the attention of the public. They are trying to do something with the public's minds or opinions there. Okay? If it's a sort of secret report from within a group, then it's got a different audience. It's for those eyes within that specific group. Okay, So again, what, uh, does that, what impact does that have on its purpose? You also need to look at in the provenance of the sources when it has been made or produced. So what do you know about this time? What is going on from your revision that you've been conducting? What do you know about this time? And how, again, is that going to influence what has been said in this source? All of that will lead you to why, the purpose. Who, what, when will help you work out why at this time this person is saying this to this specific group of people or to this intended audiences. So if you have a look through sources B, C and also interpretation D, see if you can work out what the provenance is. Pause the, uh, pause the video here. Um, see if you can work out who, what and when for each. Okay, hopefully you've had a chance to pause the video and you've come back to uh, have a look at the answers for this one. So, in terms of the provenance for source B, you've got that it's Ernst Tolman, that's the WHO, the leader of the German Communist Party. So, start thinking, well, what do I know about the Germanist Communist Party? What are they trying to do? 
reporting is the what so it's a report that he has produced reports are normally done after an event on his interrogation from the 3rd of march 1933 so that's the when so what do we know as historians about the 3rd of march 1933 what do we know that the communist party are probably trying to do on the 3rd of march 1933 what's happened just before what's happened just after this event source c then the who is the fact that it's from the Dusseldorf Gestapo. The what, well, it's a statistic report. So its intended audience is for members of the Gestapo. They're not going to release this to the public. It's for their eyes only. When 1936, so what do we know about 1936? How long have the Gestapo been about? What do we know about terror generally in 1936 in Nazi Germany? Okay, what are the Nazis' aims at this specific time? Finally, for the interpretation, this is where the provenance is slightly uh, slightly less useful. And I've talked about this in the tip section uh, in the yellow box. So you've got that it's from a book called uh, The Gestapo by a historian called Frank McDonoghue in 2015. Now, if we read the tip, it says, as we do not know enough about the historian of the time that we are writing or that they are writing their work, we cannot work out the purpose of this interpretation. We do, however, have enough for the sources from our own knowledge. So we don't know anything about the book, the Gestapo. We've never studied it as part of our topic. It's not on the exam specification. We don't know necessarily anything about the historian Frank Donoghue unless you've done lots of research outside of the unit. But it's, that's you know, unlikely because you can't know every single Nazi Germany historian. 2015, again, not particularly relevant to our understanding of living under Nazi rule. So you can't work out the purpose of Interpretation B because we don't know anything about the book, we don't know anything about the intended audience, we don't know anything about the historian or the time that they are writing. So the provenance for this one, less important. You can, it's important to be aware of it, but you don't need to uh, forensically analyse it as in the kind of level that you do for Source B and C. Okay. The next step then, once you've worked out the provenance and you've started to think about, right, well, what do I know about the who, what, when and the why? You need to actually read the source because the question is asking you, how useful are they to understanding the Gestapo? Well, to understand how useful they are to understanding the Gestapo, you need to read what they're saying. So as you are going through each of the sources and the interpretation, you need to make your inferences. And don't forget from the previous video, as we know, an inference is, well, what does it tell us about this specific focus? Now, you've got to be really careful here with your inferences, not to just lift details and then try and claim it as your own sort of uh, inference. You can't just repeat a part of the source back to me and then get the mark for an inference. It has to be something about the Gestapo either as a whole or specifically, okay? And as you are going through the sources and the interpretation, you are going to need to back that up with a quote. So I would, with my highlighter or my pen in the exam paper, be highlighting anything that we can learn about the Gestapo that you can then use as evidence. Okay, so be really careful. Make sure that your quotes are going to match your inference as well. So provenance, who, what, when, why. Inferences, what does it tell us about the focus? Quotes to back that up. So you've gone through um, with your highlighters or your pens, each of the sources and the interpretations. Now you need to actually put this into a bit of an answer. So, as ever, with any question in GCSE history, use the wording of the question to start you off. Often students will say, oh, I find uh, starting uh, my answer the hardest part. Well, it's really easy once you learn how to use the wording of the question to your advantage. So because the question was asking you how useful are they, you are going to start off in your first paragraph talking about source C, and you're going to start off by saying source B is useful. Okay, it's asking you how useful, you're going to say it is useful. Source B is useful to a historian studying, and then this is where you are going to put the focus of the question. So in this instance, it's the Gestapo between 1933 and 1939. This is because dot, 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 and this is where you make your inference. Now, once you have made your inference, you need to back that up with a quote to show the examiner that you've not just had a lucky guess. So support in the source for this is the quote. And that's where you are going to include in quotation marks your quote. This shows that, and this is where you are going to expand on what your quote is telling you. So develop your analysis of that inference. What does this quote, quote uh, reveal to us about the specific focus? Once you've done your inference and you've backed it up with a quote, this is where you need to move on to the higher level uh, elements of this question, the purpose of source B. So the purpose of source B makes it useful because don't forget, source is always useful. The purpose of source B makes it useful as it is to, and this is where you need to identify the purpose. Now, we talked in the previous video about um, what kind of words you can use when you are talking about the purpose. You need to uh, revise your purpose word knowledge bank, and I'll flash that up on the screen in uh, a little bit. 
But remember, you cannot say the purpose is to show because nobody in the 1930s or 1940s has created a source or a piece of evidence at the time to show students in uh, the 2020s what exactly uh, that is. They are trying to do something at that specific time for the audience that that source is intended for. So you need to put yourself in the shoes of people at that time. What are they trying to do at that time? They're not trying to show us anything, they're trying to do something. Once you have identified the purpose, you need to then link it back to the provenance to fully explain the purpose and how that makes it useful. So that is where you are going to link back to the who, the what, and the when, and the intended audience, okay? How does that make it useful to us in terms of its purpose? Once you've done source B, you then do exactly the same for source B. It is useful because that's where your inference goes in. Here's a quote to support that. This is what that quote means. Then you go on to the purpose. The purpose of source A is to identify the purpose using a purpose word, back that up and fully explain it by linking it back to the provenance. Who, what, when, why. Interpretation D, well, it starts off pretty much the same. Interpretation D is also useful to a historian studying, insert the uh, focus of the question. This is because there's where your inference goes in, but this is where your answer ends for interpretation D. You are only going to back it up with a quote and then you are going to expand on what that quote means. As I said in the previous slide, you cannot do the purpose of interpretation D because you do not know en uh, enough about the who, the what, or the when to analyze the purpose of it. So don't worry about the purpose for interpretation D. Now, as we talked about, when you are talking about the purpose of uh, a source, you need to have um, identified the purpose using some of the purpose words from your purpose word bank that you've hopefully built up during your revision. So for example, the purpose might be to deter, it might be to encourage, to expose, to persuade, to indoctrinate. These are just some examples that you could use in your answers. That doesn't mean that every single one will be relevant to every single source. You need to think carefully about what that source is trying to do. But once you have worked out the who, the what, the when, hopefully already in your mind, you're starting to think about, right, well, if this is um, about maybe terror and it's from a Nazi perspective, maybe they're trying to deter opposition or maybe they're trying to encourage support for these groups, okay? Or persuade or indoctrinate people that they're important. So be really careful about selecting an accurate purpose word um, for your answer. The other thing that I would like to mention is um, you will notice, obviously, because I've said you can't do the purpose for interpretation D, we always get students asking, well, should we bother writing about it? Why should we bother writing about the uh, interpretation D if we can't do the purpose and therefore can't get the top, top marks from interpretation D alone? Well, my answer always is, is that if you do source B and C only, and as sometimes can happen in an exam, you mess that up, you misunderstand it, you misread a part of it, you just don't get your answer to, to the right kind of level, well then you're kind of screwed. Because if you don't do interpretation D, you don't analyze the inference of it and you don't back it up with a quote and you um, just rely uh, solely on source B and C, you're going to be in a spot of bother because if you get that wrong, you've got no safety net to fall back on. So always do interpretation D, provided you've got the time, because it will serve as a safety net and it's good history because it will help your understanding of that focus to a greater level, okay? So always include interpretation D. Other purpose words that you could include could be to mock, okay? Uh, or to flatter as well. So it just depends on what exactly uh, the focus of the question is. Okay, so you have uh, written your answer, you've submitted it, you've checked it, you're quite happy with it. Now, your next step to understanding this 15 mark question is to understand the feedback that you will get. And to understand that, you need to work out how my answer will be marked. So you've got the question at the top of the page there. You might have two example answers that look like that, okay? If I'm an examiner, I'm going to get a range of uh, answers from um, different students. So on the board, you've got answer A and answer B. What I would like you to do in a second is to pause the video and I would like you to go through each of the answers A and B and I would like you to look for each of the skills that you need to demonstrate in your answer for a 15 mark question. So I would like you to pause the video here and I would like you to find the inference that they make about the Gestapo in their answers, the quote that they use to support this, the purpose word that they use from the purpose word bank perhaps, and the explanation of the purpose linked back to the provenance. You've also got the mark scheme in the green box, which will help you work out what mark this would get. So if we have a really quick 
skim through the mark scheme. If we start to look at uh, the one to three, that's just general assertions. Hopefully nobody's aiming down there. That's really basic stuff um, that uh, you, I am confident, will all be well above. So, uh, sorry, marks four to six then is where it gets uh, a few people um, caught out. Surface features from B or C uh, or interpretation D. That's where you've literally just said um, something like uh, source B is a report from the Gestapo in 1936. You just told me something that we can see really clearly in the source. I know that it's from the Gestapo in 1936. I know it's a report because I've been told that. You need to go beyond that. How is that report useful? Okay, not just what it is. Equally, if you argue a source is not useful, that means you are not going to get more than four marks, okay, four to six marks. If you argue any of the sources or the interpretations that are not useful, you are not going to get four marks for that individual uh, paragraph. So this is why it's really important, as I was talking about in the top tip, they are always useful. If you say that they're not useful, you are not going to get more marks than about six marks. Seven to nine marks. This is where you make a valid inference. So you tell me something about the Gestapo from one of B, C, or D, but you don't offer any support. Now, it's really uncommon for students to do this because if you made their in inference, the next step automatically is to back that up with a piece of evidence. But if you don't include any quotes or evidence from the source, this is where you will be, seven to nine marks. Equally, if you just identify the purpose of sources B or C, uh, and you don't explain it in more detail or you haven't made any uh, inferences, that's where you are going to uh, only get seven to nine marks. So we always get some students who try to cheat the system and they go straight into the purpose. So they won't write anything else and they'll just say the purpose of source A is to dot, 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 to expose or to intimidate, full stop. Yes, you might get seven to nine marks, but that's where your answer is going to stop because you haven't done the other things, you haven't made the inferences and you haven't fully explained the purpose using the provenance. 10 to 12 marks then. Uh, if you make a valid inference from the content of one of B, C or D and you back it up with a quote, you're in 10 to 12 marks. If you make two supported inferences from B, C or D, so say you do one for B, one for C, uh, that means you are going to be looking at 13 marks if you back that up with evidence. 14 marks then. If you support the explanation of the purpose to understand why it makes it useful from B or C, that's where you're going to get 14 marks. And if you do that twice, so if you fully explain the purpose or why it makes it useful um, in terms of its production, so how it's been made or its receipts or who it's for, for B and C, that's when you get 15 marks. So interpretation D doesn't feature in 14 to 15 marks, but it features at every level underneath that. That's why it's important you still do that, because if you don't, you run the risk of losing um, your kind of safety net lower down the mark scheme. So... Pause the video here, find the inference, the quote, the purpose word, the explanation. What mark would you give this answer out of 15? We will come back in a few seconds time after you've paused the video to talk about the answers. Okay, hopefully you've had a chance to pause the video then and work your way through each of the answers. Let's start to have a read through answer A. So it starts off with source B is not very useful as it is by Ernst Thalmann, who was the leader of the German Communist Party. This means he is biased and therefore probably lying about what happened to him to make the Nazis look bad. Therefore, it is not very useful. Right, this answer is quite a common answer um, in um, some particular students because they have seen that it's by Ernst Tolman, they know that he's a communist, they know that the Nazis and the communists are political enemies, therefore they assume he's lying, therefore it's biased, therefore we can't trust it. This is the problem with this answer, okay? You can't just say because it is from an enemy of the Nazis that therefore we can't trust it. It's still incredibly useful. So have they made an inference? Well, no, they haven't. They've said that it's not useful um, and they've included the word bias. I hate the word bias. I have no idea where it comes from. I think sometimes it's from maybe primary school level history you need to forget at GCSE level that the word bias ever exists because it is a really, really silly word. And the fact that often students will think bias is always a bad thing is even more damaging. Forget the word bias, okay? Forget that it's a bad thing. If it is from Ernst Tolman, yes, of course, he is not objective. Of course, he is going to have an opinion on this because of his experiences. But that makes him incredibly useful to our understanding of that time, okay? So this first answer, uh, not very useful. I would probably say that this is going to get four marks, okay? Nothing more than that. It's it's not got any proper inferences. It's just all surface features. They're just telling us that it's by Tolman. That's not particularly difficult to work out because it tells you that. Um, and they're saying that it's not useful. Four marks, nothing more, okay? 
Answer B, on the other hand, let's have a look at that. So source B is useful to a historian studying the Gestapo between 33 and 39, as it reveals to us the methods used by the Gestapo on political opponents of the Nazis to try and silence them. Right, this is a good start. This is where the inference is, okay? They're saying that they're, it's telling us about how the Gestapo tried to silence political opponents. We would expect them to back that up with a quote, and they do that. Every conceivable cruel method of blackmail was used against me. That quote matches that inference. Great, we're off to a really good start. They've got an inference, they've backed it up with a quote. They then go on to expand on what that quote actually tells us. So it shows us that the Gestapo were willing to use torture against their opponents as a way of securing confessions and also implicating other people they considered a threat to try and deter them from opposing the Nazis. Right, really good answer so far. We've got the inference, we've got the quote. Now, because they have done this from the content of one of them, I would argue at the moment we're at about 10 marks. Okay, so if we have a look sort of halfway down the mark scheme, it's a valid inference from the content of one of B, C or D. In this instance, it's B. Let's see if they can get the purpose. So what are the purpose words that they use here? Well, they say the purpose of the source is to expose and to inform the German public of the violent nature of the Gestapo at a time when the Nazis are increasingly using terror groups to clamp down on political opponents, such as the communists, in order to strengthen their dictatorship. Right, the purpose words here, expose and inform, okay? They have included straight away in the first sentence what the purpose is. They then start to link this back to the provenance. So they're saying at a time when. So they know in March 1933, the Nazis are increasingly trying to clamp down on political opponents because they want to strengthen their dictatorship. Um, they then link it back to the provenance even more. Tolman, leader of the Communist Party, is warning the German people. He is speaking to the German people in this report about what the Nazis are doing prior to the election in order to deter people from voting for them. So this answer knows in the 3rd of March 1933 there's an election right about to happen. They know after the Reichstag fire that the communists have been targeted by the Nazis to, uh, to try and silence them and encourage people not to vote for them. Therefore, they have worked out that the purpose of this source from the provenance is to try and expose the terror that the Nazis are using including the Gestapo, and that the Gestapo are being used to silence enemies in order to try and strengthen the Nazi dictatorship, okay? So because they have fully explained the purpose by linking it back to the provenance, they've done that once, this is 14 marks. If they do that again for C, 15 marks, okay? Now, on the surface, this question looks quite complicated, but hopefully after you've watched this video, it makes a little bit more sense. If you do have any additional questions, please come and talk to your class teacher about it, and we'll be happy to talk you through anything uh, further in detail. Um, keep an eye out for the next video, which will be on the 18 mark question. Thank you very much for watching.